rise up and speak his word. Rise up to what you cry. Rise up this very hour. Rise up with Jesus Christ. Rise up in Jesus' name. Open eyes and heal the lame. Rise up, declare his truth. We're the ones who cannot lose. And rise, we've got to rise. Jump right into the scriptures. There we go. So now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, actually last week, we started a new series on the new man and talking about uh, understanding the new man. That means understanding your spirit, your soul, and your body. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I guess about three weeks ago now, we started also a series on the power of words. And I've been teaching mostly on the power of words at the nine o'clock and then teaching more along the lines of the new man at the 10 o'clock. Today, we're going to switch that, and I'm going to speak first about understanding the new you, understanding the new man, understanding your body. Uh, Today, we're talking about the mind, necessarily, and so we've already talked about the spirit. I want to always tie these together. Uh, One of the things that we need to realize is that the human spirit, uh, once it is recreated, is literally the strongest thing on earth. Slightly below that is the human mind of a recreated spirit, of a born-again person. Now, from the beginning, uh, a couple of things we want to look at. Number one, as I said, when God created Adam, Adam was the highest creation of God at that time. There was nothing literally above Adam in God's creation. And that's because God made Adam as much like himself as he could. Uh, He wasn't God, obviously, but he was over this world and had dominion over this world, which effectively made him God over this world. Now, that doesn't mean that he was divine. It just means that he was the supreme being that had charge over this world locality called the earth and any supreme being over any locality would be the god of that locality uh, just by means of meaning it was in charge now god making man like adam or making man like himself say it this way that adam his spirit his soul and his body were of the highest level the spirit was the greatest creation obviously Then God put a body around it, around that spirit, and in Adam's soul, and we can see how strong Adam's soul or his mind was because it says that whenever, that God literally caused all the animals to come by and Adam named them. So Adam was able to name every creature on earth, and I would dare say that today those creatures are still called what Adam called them because he said this is what they're going to be called. So this is what they're called. Now, when Adam fell, it was first off the life of God that was connected to Adam in his spirit was cut off and the essence that kept Adam, how can we say it, viable, existing on this earth, Adam's spirit was now, the essence of that was now death. So the life of Adam was death. I know that sounds weird, but essentially death is simply the separation, especially if we're talking spiritual death, we're talking about the separation of a person's spirit from God. That's why people that are not born again are dead in their sins and trespasses because that sin nature is death and comes from death, and that death comes from man being separated from God, right? Pretty pretty simple, right? Now, When, as I said, when God created Adam, the next thing under Adam's spirit was Adam's soul. His soul, his mind, his will, his intellect, these and the emotions there, uh, his soul was the next highest entity, force, whatever you want to call it, 
on the earth at that time. And his mind was literally the mind of God in the sense of that his thoughts and his thought processes were of God. That, this is why Adam's fall was such a big deal. If Adam had been stupid, the fall would not have been that big a deal. And I mean, his life, the life would have been cut off, but God would have looked at him and said, oh, you poor stupid man. But he didn't do that. He said, I put you in charge. You're to have dominion over this. You were to guard this, and you didn't because you let somebody else talk you into not doing what you were supposed to do. Bottom line. Now, so Adam's mind was extremely powerful. Now, and, and I only have 45 minutes here on this session, and so we are not going to be able to get into any real depth of some of these things, but I will be doing some more teaching here in the very near future. Uh, it'll probably, I'll probably just teach it and record it and then bring it out because we don't have enough Sundays for me to teach all this stuff, and most of you are not here Monday through Thursday. So uh, I have to teach it and then put it out there rather than have you sitting here. So you may have noticed there are times that I go uh, not during the 9 o'clock because we have a cutoff. At the 10 o'clock, I can go over a little bit. Don't laugh. Okay, no. <laughs> I know you're laughing at a little bit because it's usually a lot bit. Okay, But you have to understand, the only reason I go long on that is not just because I want to talk. It's because I want you to get what will help you. And I don't waste my time talking just to talk or to record something. Everything I do is geared to helping every believer to grow up to be like Jesus. And I don't want, if there's 10 points you need to know, and I only get to three, you know, in an hour's time, I know it's going to take more than that to go over. I try not to, but I don't want you to leave when point number six is the very point you needed that can change your life. But most people are trained to a 28 minute and 30 second time system because of television and so usually about at the 29 minute mark most people start zoning out right or trying to switch channels and they realize they don't have a remote that can shut me up <laughs> so we go on with that but the key is I can tell you what I know today and what works for me and what has helped me in everything that I've done for God I didn't get it in 30 minute sermons I got it from 30 years of daily study, usually hours on hours on hours. That's how I got it. And I'm trying to give it to you as quickly as I can in a condensed form as I can and still not lose any of the essence or the power of it. Because I'm more interested in your growth than I am a clock or even if you stay to listen. Because your blood... It's not going to be on my hands. It's that simple. I will give you everything that I can by the help of God to make sure your life looks more like Jesus' life. So that's why I tend to go long. I wouldn't plan on even saying that, and I've already lost four minutes, right? So now, as I said, uh, when God created Adam, he made him the closest that he could to himself and he made him that way in spirit, in soul, and in body. Because believe it or not, God has a body. I don't know if you know that or not. He has a body. And that body is a divine body, obviously. But it is a body in the sense that it encompasses who he is. Now, and there's many references to his body throughout the Bible, especially in the book of Psalms. Uh, but, again, that's not for right now. Now, when he made man's spirit, soul, and body... All of these were made in a way that was as close to God as he could make them, put it that way. Now, his mind was the same. When Adam fell, Adam did not lose really his intellect. Now, there is some dumbing down that you could say happened. <clears throat> but if you look at many times even today, and we have to differentiate between then and now because things are slightly different uh, be, for all kinds of reasons, mostly physiological, 
in the sense that the earth is no longer the same as it was when Adam was here uh, because Adam, uh, the earth and how God created it had a certain atmosphere that is different than we have today. When I say atmosphere, I'm not talking about your spiritual feelings. I'm talking about the air barometric pressure, the actual atmosphere that we're in, right? I'm talking about air. I'm talking about space and these things and the, you know, the, the various levels of atmospheric pressure that we have on this earth. And because that atmosphere is different, then we don't get the same oxygen to our brains that Adam got, right? That's why dinosaurs, things like that, had very small hearts, fairly small brains. And whenever the barometric pressure changed in the earth, uh, that's whenever the dinosaurs started dying off because they couldn't breathe and so they would die. Now, that's a whole other thing, too. Sorry, I'm getting, we got like four different sermons going already. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm trying to illustrate the point that man's intelligence uh, with Adam was very high, and then it dropped, and then it started coming back up again, and then it drops again. Why? Because man's fallen man's brain, his understanding, let me, let me just say it this way, in... Um, well, when man fell, his understanding was darkened. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth, from now on, walk not as other Gentiles walk. What's he telling the Ephesians? Don't walk like everybody else. Don't think like everybody else. Right? He's saying live differently than everybody else. Christians should live different than non-Christians. I know that's a revelation to many, okay? But he says, and he even tells them, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. This is how fallen man walks, in the vanity of his mind, right? That's why Paul actually also said at one point, well, in Romans, he said, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought. That is how fallen man thinks. He thinks of himself more highly than he ought. Right? Now, that's, that's the typical way of thinking, and that has to be changed even to really, well, you can function that way in the natural world and get away with it. You can even sometimes thrive with it, but that's not how we can live as Christians. We cannot live in the vanities of our mind. We cannot live based on, well, this is the way I want things to be. We have to live according to how things are, according to the word of God. Now, he says here in verse 18, having the under, now this, he's talking about the vanity of their mind, how their mind works. Having the understanding darkened, why? Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Right? Now watch, because of the blindness of their heart. Now this is a big sentence to be unpacked if you want to use those terms. Because it talks about having the darkened... Okay, you walk in the vanity of your mind if you're, if you're not born again. Now here's the thing, because we have to be very specific here, because you can be born again and walk in the vanity of your mind. Having your understanding darkened, right? Why? Because you have not had your mind renewed to what the Word of God says. And if you don't have your mind renewed to what the Word of God says, then your understanding is still darkened. Even though you might have had enough understanding to realize you need to get born again, so you did. So that would be one sliver <coughs> of your understanding that got enlightened. And from there, that one cut, you might say, should in grow by having your mind renewed on a regular basis. But I will tell you this, you cannot renew your mind 30 minutes on Sunday. It is impossible because you have 167 and a half other hours that something is, how can I say, vying for your mind. It's always trying to get your attention. There's always information that's trying to get to you that is either keeping your mind where it is, making it even more unrenewed than it is, or trying to get your mind renewed to the Word of God. Now, guess where all those things come from? Two of them come from the world. One of them comes from God. 
but you get to choose on a regular basis which one you listen to. Now, notice though it says that you have the, or that people, have the understanding darkened. Why? They are alienated from the life of God. Why? Because they have ignorance of God, so they have not connected to God. And because of the blindness of their heart, now they won't change their mind. And in verse 19, it gives you more descriptions of it. It says, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That doesn't sound good at all, does it? I mean, that's just a whole bunch of bad right there. Amen? And but it tells you this is what happens when your understanding is darkened and you've been cut off from the life of God. So when you get born again, the life of God is brought back into your spirit. Your spirit is recreated. And in your spirit, you are again recreated after the likeness and image of God after Jesus Christ in true holiness and righteousness. So your spirit is good because God made it good and you are complete in him. Now, the problem then goes back to the mind. And that's what we want to talk about today. We're going to look at because this is the area where most people have problems. See, the, the biggest problem that Christians and non-Christians, well, let's say Christians, because non-Christians can't do this anyway, technically. But the biggest problem that Christians have is that they, most of, many of them, I'm trying to get my words accurate, many Christians come to church every Sunday to get fixed. God never said he would fix you. He said you had to die. And the church doesn't teach dying. It teaches fixing. Why? Because fixing means people get to counsel people and feel important. And broken people want to feel important. So you got broken people counseling broken people and there's only one person getting any help out of that, and that's the broken counselor. And the only help he's getting out of that is he feels good about himself. That is not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't come along counseling people into betterness. He told them, man, if you know, <laughs> I'm telling you, there's some stuff I want to preach. I can't today. I don't have time. If I get started, I'm telling you. But, but I will tell you this much. If we ever see Jesus the way he is and understand that we have been recreated into his likeness in the spirit, we will start scratching and clawing whatever we got to do in our life to get our mind renewed to his mind. But most people, instead of, see, that's the problem. It, most people, instead of wanting to get his mind, they want to get their mind fixed. But their mind is so messed up, it can't be fixed. It must die. And Jesus never said, come to me and I'll make you better. He said, you cannot be my disciple if you don't carry your cross and deny yourself. That's what he said. Now, that's not what the church today says. The church today says, well, whatever you give God, he'll be glad to get it. However you want to worship, he'll be glad to receive it. Even though there is nothing in the Bible that says anything like that, and everything in the Bible says exactly the opposite. And we can see that all the way through the Bible, even back to Cain and Abel. God rejected certain sacrifices. Why? Because they were not done the way he said do it. But now we think, eh, God got tired of fighting and just said, hey, do whatever you want to do. I'll take it. That's not what happened. He's still God. He hasn't gotten any weaker. He hasn't gotten older. He hasn't gotten tired. He's probably got fed up. But that's different than tired. So anyway. Because what we want to talk about is the renewed mind. We want to talk about the mind. Now, listen carefully. We want to talk about the mind of the new man, the mind of the new creation. And we have to be specific in these things. So this may be a several-part series you know, from this session alone. But we have to look at the mind because the, the, 
technically the mind of a new creation is supposed to be the mind of Christ. If your mind is not the mind of Christ, then are you a new creation? Now, yes, I would say you are, meaning if you drop dead, your spirit will go to be with God. And if you're not a new creation and you drop dead, your spirit will not go to be with God. So I would say even if your mind is still messed up, even if your mind is not the mind of Christ, then yeah, you drop dead, you'll go to be with him, and the surprise and everything will be even greater than it would have been if your mind was the mind of Christ. Because if your mind is as the mind of Christ, when you step into eternity, you're not going to be surprised a bit. But if your mind has been your mind all along and you haven't changed your mind and you haven't brought your mind into alignment with the Word of God, then whenever you stand in front of God and you enter into His presence, you're going to be shocked. Why? Because you're going to think, wow, look at all that was given to me that I'd never used. Look at all that could have I could have been in Christ but wasn't because I was so satisfied just being fixed a little bit every Sunday. Because the mind of the new creation is the mind of Christ. But most new creations still function under the old mind rather than the mind of Christ. And instead of getting the mind of Christ, we try to fix the old mind, which you have to realize there are some things, <clears throat> no matter what, do you, okay, if you don't plug the hole, it doesn't matter how much water you pour in the bucket. <laughs> it's going to pour right on out. So the first step is to plug the bucket, plug the hole. Isn't that right? Then you can fill the thing up. But if you keep trying to just come back and get fixed and get fixed and get fixed, let me tell you, the very nature of the mindset that you have grown up with before you were born again, see, your mind thinks a certain way and it thinks according to the old way of living and not according to the Word of God. And whenever you think that way, the very thought process that you have uh, solidified by thinking, you realize every time you think a thought, you are solidifying previous thoughts or you're undoing previous thoughts and getting a new thought, which is renewing the mind. All right? Now, every the way you think is the way you have trained yourself to think. Or let me put it this way. You've either trained yourself to think that way or you have allowed yourself to be trained to think that way. See, school is not about information, right? You don't need to go to school to get information, especially today. We got internet, you got books, I mean, you got everything, right? So school was never intended just to give you information. True school, all the way from first grade, all the way through, if you want to say college or whatever it is, all of that was geared to teach you how to think, not what to think. Well, guess what? Today we're seeing that. Why? Because now they're not teaching so much information. Now they are absolutely indoctrinating and teaching you how to think a certain way, which is absolutely contrary to the Word of God. If I had kids in school, well, let me put it this way. I would never have kids in school. I would not put kids in school today. Not in elementary, not in middle school, not in high school, not in college, not in university. I don't care because they're all under a mindset that is contrary to the Word of God. You say, are you telling me I should get my kids out of school? Let me be clear. Yes. <laughs> Take them out. Teach them yourself. Oh, I can't afford it. I don't know enough. Then you start learning and get around people that do know that can help and trade off skills if you need to. But you say, well, I can't do that. I have to earn a living. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, sacrifice your child for convenience, for a comfortable life, because that's what you're doing. It's not even about what your child learns. They're, the school is a babysitter for most people. While they go to work, it's something for their kids to do, so they don't have to worry about them. Let me tell you, I don't, I don't uh, promote worry. If your kids are in school, you should worry. You say, oh, no, I should just, I should just pray. No, you don't just pray. 
you remove the problem. You got to plug the hole in the bucket. You don't just pray because that school system is anti-you, anti-God, anti-Bible from start to finish. Oh, my teacher's a Christian. Then her witness is ruined because she will not be able to open her mouth or him in that place. Now, I've gotten totally off the subject here, but <laughs> it's a fact. Amen? That's why even, and well, and you know that most Christian schools are just where they take the bad kids out of school and put them in another school. Anyway, so that's a whole other thing by itself. But um, things have to be changed before things will change. Simple as that. I know you say, well, that's redundant. Well, apparently not, because it hadn't been done yet. So now let's keep on going. He says here in verse 19, going back to how the mind thinks, because as I said, we've got to be specific, because even in Christians, you've got carnally minded people and you've got spiritually minded people. And that's in Christians. So if that's in Christians, now see, you've got spiritually minded, then you've got carnally minded, then you've got unsaved, which is even more so carnally minded. And even with the Christian, see, we talk about carnally minded Christians and spiritually minded Christians. And then you've got people that are carnally spiritually minded, which is the blend in between. That's called a double minded person. That's a person that says, oh, the word of God is true. Oh, yes, it's absolute. The Bible is the word of God and it's true. And, you know, I sure hope we can pay our bills this month. That's a double minded Christian. Why? Because the Bible says God will meet your needs. Not I hope we can meet this, or I hope I get healed, or I hope I get this, or whatever it is. If the Bible has already said it, and you believe the Bible, you have to say what the Bible has said. You can't say you believe the Bible and then speak contrarywise to it and say you still believe it. So now he says here in verse 19, and this again, this is a, classif- or a uh, characteristic of a person who has had their understanding darkened. It says, in verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now notice, past feeling. In other words, when it's not talking about just past feelings as a whole. It's saying you are past the point where doing wrong bothers you. And when you are past the point where doing wrong bothers you, guess what? Welcome to Christianity 21st century because people call that grace. That's not grace. That's a reprobate mind. All right. I'll, okay, anyway. Okay. I was listening to a guy preach this weekend, and he kept, he was down in the front, and he kept walking over here, and he'd say something, and then he'd say, he'd say it, and there was silence. He'd say, okay, I'll try it on this side. And he walked to the other side. I just thought about doing it myself there for a second. Anyway. <laughs> So, verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. In other words, he's saying that's not you. You don't have your understanding darkened. Your understanding has been enlightened. And because of that, you don't do these things. You don't, have, have, you don't give yourself over to lasciviousness, which is absolute riotous, wrong living uh, with no limits, you might say, with no boundaries. He says you're not like that. You've not learned Christ like that. He said, verse 21, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, number 20, verse 22, look at this, that you put off concerning the former lifestyle, the word there is conversation, it's an old English word for lifestyle, that you put off concerning the former way you lived, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Now what it says, put that off, Put away your old way of living. That means you have to change your mind to start living differently. He says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now notice we're told to have our mind renewed in Romans chapter 12. But here he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The spirit of your mind. You hear that? Your mind has a spirit. Now, here's what most people do. Most people come into the church. They hear truth and they can quote the truth. They can quote the Bible. They say these things, but they, and and honestly, I'm just going to be blunt with you. These are your 
Sunday morning Christians. They're in church every Sunday morning. Uh, they live maybe a decent life, you know, a good life, however you want to say it. Uh, they're not out sinning, carousing, running around, doing all the stuff, not out getting drunk on the weekends and all the stuff they used to do, right? But they come to church, they hear it, but now notice, they, they go far enough to hear the truth and usually they get enough truth to feel bad about themselves because they don't know how to get free from some of the things that they used to do and in many cases still do. But they have not gone far enough to be renewed in the spirit of their mind. And being renewed in the spirit of your mind literally means go because the world, the spirit of the mind of the world is absolutely negative. When you are renewed in the spirit of your mind, you will be positive in your thinking. Now, listen, I'm not just talking about positive thinking, right? Positive thinking, it's, it's, it's a uh, carryover from Adam when he fell. And it's amazing because people can be <laughs> positive-minded negatively. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, yes. Oh, and, oh, and it's going to get worse. How do you know? Oh, I'm sure of it. Yeah, I'm positive it's going to get worse. You are a positive negative. Do you see that? Well, you watch. It ain't as bad as it's going to get yet. It's going to get worse yet. You watch. Okay, that's a negative. See, the spirit, you can be talking about something, but the spirit of your mind still be negative. But when you have your mind renewed to the word of God, the spirit of your mind will become positive. Why? Listen, faith is not positive thinking, but faith will cause positive thinking. It will cause it. It will cause you to expect good things. It, you will expect things to happen that go for you, not against you. That's, that's what will take place, right? Just because of faith towards God, you know he has your back. You know that he's looking out for you. You know he wants the best for you. And it will create that. But many people, you know, they, they can quote the word, but then still be negative-minded. These are the people that die quoting by his stripes, I was healed. Why? Because it's what you believe, not just what you say. Now, what you say should come out of your heart of what you believe. But there are people that will say things that they're not believing yet, and they think because they're just saying it that it's going to work. Now, if you say it long enough, you'll believe it. Then it'll start working. But it's the believing that makes it work, not just the saying. But if you're going to believe it, you're going to have to say it. Does that make sense? It's really a closed cycle. You have to say it to believe it, and then you believe it because you say it. And then you say it to believe it, and then you believe it because you say it. And, and be, then you say it because you believe it. So you see, it's a closed system. It constantly builds on itself. But most people never go that far. You know, they, they come in for a dose of hope. But, and, and understand, hope is important, but hope isn't enough. There has to be faith applied, right? Now, Notice he says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and, verse 24, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, I just quoted this a minute ago. But notice he says, that, now notice, this is something for you to do. You have to do this. He says you are to put off, number one, he says you have to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So this means that there is some effort some, something directed toward you changing the spirit of your mind. That means you have to have your mind renewed to the word of God, right? But now then he says, and you put off the old man, the old lifestyle, and put on the new man. And how do you do that? Well, tell me, what is this new man like? Well, he was recreated in righteousness and true holiness after the image of Jesus, who is the image of God. So there is a choice you make and a thing you do that when you catch yourself doing what you used to do or thinking the way you used to think, that you take those thoughts captive, and we're going to look at that, but you take those thoughts captive and you go, no, this is the truth. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. And then you replace that with this, 
and you do it until this becomes the way you normally do things. That is a process in your life. You do it. God doesn't do it for you. He will help you if you ask him to. But he will not force you to do anything. But you can rely on his strength to get it done and you can start renewing your mind. But let me tell you, this is not an overnight thing. It's like I you know, posted on Facebook even this weekend is that most people want, they want to come to church and in you know, 30 minutes, they want to get a problem solved that took them 30 years to develop. Well, can God do that? Of course he can. But once he does his part and does that change and fixes that problem, now you've got to live like that problem's fixed and live from then on. You can't go back living and thinking and talking about the problem as though it's still a problem. You have to actually have to change your mouth, you have to change your thoughts, and you have to change your actions to line up with whatever happens in the service. So if I lay hands on you and release the life of God and say, be healed in Jesus' name, you can't walk out of here saying, well, I hope that worked. Because I can tell you right then, it didn't. If you say, I hoped it did. But I can tell you this, I did what I was supposed to do. I released life into you. Now, all you have to do is say, you know what? The Bible says a believer lays hands on the sick and they recover. So therefore, Brother Curry is a believer. He laid hands on me. I shall recover. End of story. And then somebody walks up to you and says this horrible thing. Probably one of the most worst things anybody can say to a person. How do you feel? What has that got to do with anything? Now, let me put it this way. Um, I feel exactly the same way Jesus felt when he overcame this feeling. <laughs> Think about that. What does that mean? That means that you can have feelings, but you don't rely on them. See, you, you will never hear me ask somebody, how, you, how do you feel? I've, I, I can't remember if I've ever asked anybody that. Not, it's been, you know, if anything, 30, 40 years. Why? Because I'm not trying to find out how you feel. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to change your mouth. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to nullify whatever you've been believing God for. Now, I might ask, how are you? To which I hope to hear, by his stripes I'm healed, or whatever else you're believing God for, because that's how you are, right? But now, if you're going through something and you need help, then you need to be able to say, well, you know what? Uh, the Bible says, by his stripes I'm healed, but you know what? I need, I need a little help right now. Okay, well, I believe you're healed too. Now, what we got to do to make sure you're there? Amen? It's not wrong to say you need help, right? But it is wrong to walk around all the time saying, well, I believe the word of God, <laughs> but I'm still sick, <laughs> and I don't feel good. And, I, and what about this? Well, how do I feel? Oh, you don't understand how bad it is. It is amazing. The people that, okay, I just want you to realize this. The people that spend the most time talking about how they feel are totally selfish. Why? Because what are they talking about? Them. You walk up to them and go, wow, you would not believe what just happened to me. Really? Well, tell me about it in a minute because right now I want to tell you how bad I'm doing. And they will interrupt you to tell you how bad they're doing. It, it is amazing to watch people actually function that way. And it's like, and then people say they want you to agree with them. I always, if somebody tells me that, tells me something, and, and they're, they're trying to get me to agree, a lot of times I'll just tell them, do you want me to agree with you on that? Well, what do you mean? Well, if I agree, then it'll just get worse. If I agree with what you said, you're going to get a lot worse. So you don't want me to agree. Why? Because my words come to pass. So you don't want me to agree with what you just said about how bad you feel. Now, if you want to say, by his stripes you were healed, I'll agree with you that quick. And guess what? By his stripes you were healed. But that means you have to renew your, your mind and the spirit of your mind to automatically go toward the positive as a as instead of toward the negative. Amen? Does that make sense? So I know I'm, we've got to be emphasized. This is a, the, the biggest problem in probably the local body here is that until we all start saying the same thing, we can't move forward as a body or as individuals. And when I say saying the same thing, I'm talking about all of us saying the same thing and all of what we're saying is what Jesus said. That's what I'm talking about. Until we're all in agreement there, 
then we can't move forward as a body corporately and we can't and you won't move forward individually. Now, you can agree with the word of God, in which case I will agree with you and you and I can move forward. But the body won't move forward until the body is saying the same thing. Amen? Does that make sense? Now, in this, let's keep going here because we're talking about man's mind. And there's, there's, some, there's a lot on this, and again, which I'm not going to get to today. But notice here it says in verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And then we go right to Romans chapter 12, which you've, I've already quoted several times. But he says in 12, uh, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, number one, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And number two, be not conformed to this world, but number three, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Then 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16 it says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Okay, now we have the mind of Christ right here in this book. Why? Because this, Jesus was this book personified and made alive, right? He was the word of God, is the word of God. And this book is him and he is this book personified and brought into living. That's why as we have our minds renewed to what this word says, then our life starts looking more like how Jesus wants our life to look. Now, uh, a couple of things on this mind thing, and I know I don't have a lot of time here, but two things. Number one, people say, oh, well, it, you know, I had this thought, I had this idea, but was it God or was it me? Okay, that's, that's probably the number one thing I hear. Secondly, is just below it, is this. Um, I had this thought, and now, now I hardly ever hear this unless I'm talking with somebody kind of in depth. But they'll say, well, I have this thought and, 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 you know, I can't believe I'm thinking this way. And it's funny because if you have a good thought, you can't tell if it's you or God. But if you have a bad thought, you automatically assume it's you. Why would you not assume it's the devil? That's why he says taking these thoughts captive, taking them into captivity. Why? Because every thought that comes into your head ain't from you. Right? The devil sends thoughts. And, that, and it's amazing how people go, well, you know, I just, I'm just, I can't believe I'm thinking like this. What makes you think you are? I was talking last night with somebody. We were talking about this very thing. And, you know, there's things in the, in the past, right, uh, that the enemy would try to bring a thought. You know, try to bring something up, you know, a remembrance or something. And he does that in me, he does it in you, he does it in everybody. He tries to get in that way. The problem is, and, and as I was talking to this person, uh, what was George? I'll tell you, I was, talking, I was talking to George. And so we were talking about this. And I said, if that thought, if a thought comes to me like that, I don't say, oh, shame on you, Curry, you shouldn't think like that. You know why? Because I know I don't think like that. So if that thought comes, I know it ain't me. I know it's the devil. And I take that thought captive and I cast that thing down. And but why? Because it's trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And so I automatically, I know that ain't me. You know why I know that ain't me? It's real simple. I don't think past. I think future. I don't live in the past. I live in the future. I'm looking at what, I'm, I'm, I live in, in Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has great plans for me. His plans are not evil, but they're good to bring me to a certain end. Amen? So I know how I think. And so whenever a negative thought comes like that or a, a past thought or something, it's always, you know, either a picture or a thought or something like that. I know that's the devil. Why? Because I know I don't think like that. Now, here's the thing. If that's how you normally think, then yes, I can understand why you'd have a problem trying to figure out if that's you or the devil. So the key is very simply this, change your mind. Start thinking according to the word of God. Start thinking the positive. Start thinking in faith. Faith never expects the worst. It never expects the worst. Now, faith is not blind in the sense that it can see patterns. 
And so you can know certain things about certain people because of the patterns in their life. You can know these things about them. But your faith is always looking to be surprised. Right? Well, you don't know what they did to me. Yeah, but you don't know what, if they're going to try to do it again. Right? All you know, maybe they've changed. And so we're always willing to give people hope to change, but then we think negative. And so we, we have to learn to think the way the Word of God talks. It's amazing how the word of God talks. Now, finishing up here, notice this. Um, yeah. He says here, I want to give you, where is that? Yep, I'm trying to go to one spot. Here we go. In uh, Philippians, yeah, chapter four, it said, verse five, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. That means don't take careful thought, worry, Right? For in anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now notice, if you do that, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you do what? If you let your request be made known unto God, right? Then he says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Well, guess what? This is the only thing that's true. Yeah. Whatsoever things are honest. This is honest. Whatsoever things are just. Yep, just. See, a lot of people don't like just. Right? <clears throat> Whatsoever things are pure. There you go. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You hear that? You know what that means? <laughs> it means you can't turn on the television. <laughs> Especially the news. <laughs> okay? You will not find that in there. Now, maybe there's some things that are, well, particular news channel that I watch. But anyway, I'll tell you what, it's victory news. If you watch that, then you'll hear some good stuff. Okay. Now, but that's pretty much the only news. Now, finally, he said, think on these things. Those things which you've both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the peace of God shall be with you. Now, notice the peace of God which passes all understanding. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, he says that he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So if you are not in perfect peace, isn't that amazing? Jesus said, this is what I'm leaving you, my peace. My peace, not the world's peace, which means absence of conflict. My peace is peace in the midst of conflict. And he said, I'm giving you my peace. And he said that he will keep you in perfect peace. How? If your mind is stayed on him. So if you're not in perfect peace and you tell people that, and you will by how you talk, then we can know your mind is not stayed on him. Your mind is stayed on Washington. Your mind is stayed on the border. Your mind is stayed on something other than him. Do you get that? If you want perfect peace, keep your mind stayed on him Think on things that are good and true and honest and pure and good report and virtue, all that. That's where you keep your mind. But most Christians don't do that. Most, the one people that should have the most peace about us being basically at the end of the world, and yet these are the people that worry about it the most, which just means you don't think you're ready for it. So change. Be ready. Have your mind renewed, have your mouth renewed, amen, and start to speak what God has said. I'm telling you, if you start this and you do it consistently, it will change your life no matter what. No matter what's going on around you, it will change. Why? Because your mind as a new creation is so amazing, so amazing. It's the mind of Christ. It, that's the mind you're supposed to have. And as your mind is renewed to the word of God, you start to access the mind of Christ. And when you access the mind of Christ, fear goes, worry goes, peace comes. Honestly, all the blessings of God come. The blessings of God can't come to you unless your mind is renewed. Let me put it this way. To the degree your mind is renewed, the blessings of God can come in your life. He can't bless you beyond your knowledge of him. And you have to, to, your knowledge of him means how much your mind is renewed to think the way he thinks. Because let me tell you, God is not wasteful. 
And if he dumped a lot of blessing on you, because he's already granted it, but if he dumped them physically into your life, if your mind is not renewed and think accurately, you will waste them. You'll be the person that wins the lottery. And in five years, you're deeper in debt than you were before and you spend all the money and it's all gone. Why? Because they don't know how to deal with that blessing. And if you don't know how to deal with a blessing, God can bless you and you'll waste it and you'll lose it and it'll disappear. And then you'll wonder why God took it. And it wasn't God. It was the thief that comes to steal from you. Amen? That makes sense? So we will talk more about this at a future time, but I just want you to understand how powerful. We, we could go into a lot of things on this. Maybe we will, because there is aspects of this. Uh, Watchman Nee actually wrote a book called The Latent Power of the Human Mind or Human Soul, Human Mind. And in that, he talks about most of the manifestations that take place in a church service. And most of that is not spiritual, but, become, but comes from <clears throat> the mind of Christians because their minds are so powerful. See, we don't talk about it much, but your mind is only slightly less powerful than your spirit. It has to be. You, you couldn't have a powerful spirit and then have a mind that is juvenile. Why? Because the power of your spirit would just blow your mind. It'd be like a breaker. It'd just go off. Why? Because your mind couldn't handle Think about it. You're, in your spirit is the mind of Christ, and the mind of Christ has thoughts, and those thoughts go into your thoughts, and you have to have your mind renewed to his thoughts, or else he couldn't release those thoughts into you because they are so powerful, you, you, you couldn't take it. But that's how powerful your mind is. But most people only use it in the negative. And then they wonder why the thing they feared came upon them. Why? Because it's just like faith. It draws. Fear will draw the negative. Just like faith automatically draws the positive from God. Amen? Y'all get anything out of this this morning? We would like to stay connected with you and give you an opportunity to become a member, therefore allowing us to pray for your specific needs. You do not have to be here physically to join or be a member of our church, so you are welcome to join membership from wherever you are. There are three ways you can access our membership. You can download the JGLM app from the App Store and Google Play right on your phone. You can also go to dominionlifechurch.org and click on Join the Church. Third, you may fill out a physical membership form right here in our lobby at Dominion Life Church. If you're interested in becoming a certified divine healing technician, starting or joining a life team, please visit startlifeteams.com forward slash locate. There, you will also find links to our weekly Get Started calls and our Q&A calls. The Get Started calls are every Tuesday at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, and the Q&A calls are every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. We wanted to inform you of several ways you can partner with us through giving. You can give online at jglm.org or dominionlifechurch.org and click on Give. You can also give through the JGLM app, or you can text to give by texting the keyword JGLM and the amount to 833 245-6345. If you want to give by check, please make it payable to JGLM or Dominion Life Church. 